Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to our discussion on EU integration of the Western Balkans, how to revive a stalling process. Thank you so much for your interest in today's topic and for joining uh, the seminar. Uh, this webinar. I am I'm Valeska Esch. Um, I'm Deputy Executive Director of the Aspen Institute Germany. And um, I am very, very pleased to, to have such a great um, panel with me. Um, I apologize for a slight delay and we're actually still waiting for one of our speakers. Um, but um, before I introduce our distinguished panel to you, just allow me a, a very quickly um, a few housekeeping remarks. Um, this discussion is on the record. We, we are recording this discussion and we will have a moderate discussion in the first part of the event and in the second part you will all be able to ask your own questions either either through uh, using the raise hand function or the Q&A function um, but please if you send in your questions in writing please keep them short um, and I would like to also use this opportunity to thank the German Foreign Office for their support of this event through the means of the stability pact for Southeast Europe and now um, I would like to turn to today, today's topic and again I'm excited to welcome such a distinguished panel for this important discussion uh, Michaela Matuela is the acting director of Western Balkans in DG near of the European Commission thank you Ms. Matuela for taking the time to join us. Um, Sabine Stör is the director for the EU financial framework and EU policies in the German Federal Foreign Office and um, in the former head of the Western Balkans division as well. Thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon to, to share the German government's perspective. Um, Simonida Katsaska is the director of the European Policy Institute in Skopje and also a member of the Think for Europe network, which is a regional think tank network with members from all six Western Balkan countries with a strong focus of the EU on the EU integration process of the Western Balkans. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Simonida, for, for being here as well. And we're still waiting uh, for Gerald Knaus, but I'll introduce him nonetheless. Um, he's the founding chairman of the European Stability Initiative, um, which has repeatedly published suggestions also on how to reform the EU integration process um, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to hearing his ideas today. Um, as mentioned, uh, we would like to take a look um, at the issue of the EU integration of the Western Balkans this afternoon. Um, what was once uh, the promise of a brighter future for all six Western Balkan countries as members of the European Union has become somewhat a source of frustration on both sides. Um, we have seen a stalling reform progress uh, and democratic backsliding in many of the countries of the region, in particular in the two so-called frontrunners, Serbia and Montenegro, over the past years, raising many doubts in EU member states about a serious and sustainable transformation of countries. Um, but also we have repeatedly seen delays on the EU side when it comes to rewarding progress made by accession candidates. We also see an increasing lack of political engagement, I would argue, and interest among at least some of the EU member states. And these developments uh, culminated in a veto by the French government on opening accession negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia in late 2019 and a new enlargement methodology with the goal of enhancing the accession process and improving its implementation um, was developed. And this new methodology was supposed to bring more credibility, a stronger political steer, a more dynamic pro process and more predictability to the process as well. However, um, and this is also where I, I, I'll end and, and hand over to Ms. Matuela, um, Albania, North Macedonia, nonetheless, have not been able to start their negotiations as the process remains stuck over a veto by Bulgaria against the accession framework uh, for North Macedonia. And um, Ms. Matuela, um, how do you assess the current state of affairs in the integration process of the Western Balkans, and especially with view to the implementation of the new methodology and the changes it was supposed to bring in terms of enhancing the process? So please, Ms. Matuela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to be part of uh, this panel and of this uh, discussion with this impressive um, audience. And, and let me just start by, um, reiterated that in these uh, complex and, and challenging times when also question marks are raised, as, as, as you mentioned, on where the EU stands also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the enlargement policy, uh, the Western Balkan is a strategic priority for the EU. It is integral part of Europe, it is geographically surrounded by member states, its past, its present, and the future is intrinsically linked with the EU. And these are not just words, 
even if words are important, like those uh, that the President von der Leyen uh, uh, pronounced today in the State of the Union address to the European Parliament that uh, you have probably followed, where uh, remarkably uh, she mentioned, of course, the Western Balkans and the importance of connecting the future of the Western Balkans to uh, the future of, of Europe. And in that same uh, speech, she also announced a visit to the region is a visit that will take place uh, at the end of the month, so just a week before the EU Western Balkan summit uh, in, uh, in Berto. Uh, and, and I think both the visits and the summit mark uh, again the importance that the EU uh, attaches to the region. Um, the summit will also be an important opportunity, of course, to reconfirm the perspective, the EU perspective of the Western Balkans and uh, provide certain uh, also impetus to all the processes that are part of our engagement with the region to move the region closer to the European Union. Of course, the economic investment plan, which is at the core of our uh, engagement with the region, but together, of course, with all the other reform priorities that are related to the fundamentals. Uh, now, I don't go into the details of that. Uh, we will certainly have time to be, probably touch upon some of these uh, elements later on in the discussion. And it's in this context of uh, uh, our uh, engagement uh, with the region where uh, not only we have a number of tools, uh, as I mentioned, the economic investment plan being one of them, um, our negoci negotiation uh, process and our stabilization association agreement being, of course, the second um, big element, but also in general, let's say the engagement that goes beyond the accession process and that uh, uh, in a way uh, can uh, uh, be related rather to the treatment uh, that the EU resource to the Western Balkans as uh, partners in a number of uh, processes and also facing certain challenges. And of course, let me mention in this context, the um, uh, very close uh, involvement that uh, we had uh, of the Western Balkans in the various tools that we had to face uh, the, the, COVID, uh, the COVID crisis uh, beyond, of course, uh, vaccines and vaccination campaigns uh, as well. So then uh, this brings me to uh, the point that uh, you have asked me to touch upon, which is the, the new methodology. And indeed, it was excited to add dynamics, political steer to the enlargement process that we have decided to review the enlargement uh, methodology and clearly to respond to requests that were coming from uh, member states that uh, wanted to uh, uh, review the way we are um, managing the um, accession process. And our reverse methodology wants really to strengthen the credibility, the predictability. You are very familiar with these uh, um, sort of four uh, pillars of uh, the new methodology, um, which, are focused, which is focused on credibility and predictability, as I said, but also um, the um, stronger political steer and the more, uh, let's say, uh, dynamism in the work process. And let me look a little bit at this in, in a nutshell in terms of what it is that we wanted to do, but making very clear that the purpose was really not to redesign completely the enlargement process. It was really to, to strengthen it with a clear goal uh, that remains, of course, a session. And when we look at credibility, obviously, is credibility on, on both sides. It's credibility, first of all, from uh, the partner countries, because it's important that the political leaders show that the commitments that they are taken are followed up uh, to. This is the best way to reassure member states that obviously um, have expressed uh, certain, uh, let's say, reluctances in the course of the accession process, but also addressing the very legitimate concerns of citizens, because let's not forget that the process is a process of transformation that, of course, prepares the country to join the European Union, but first of all, um, transform uh, the countries to be better uh, at uh, uh, the service of, of their citizens. And, uh, uh, and of course, we also need to work on the credibility on uh, the, um, uh, on the um, EU side, uh, which uh, puts at the core of the process the fact that this is a process that has to be uh, merit-based. And of course, uh, here, uh, we, uh, you know very uh, well uh, where the Commission stands when it comes also to the opening, for instance, of accession negotiations with Albania and, uh, and North Macedonia. I mentioned the stronger political steer. Uh, what we wanted to see, what we have proposed in this revised methodology is really to have, uh, let's say, a stronger political leadership on both sides. 
uh, having the top level engagement from uh, the countries, but also having member states much more involved uh, into the, the process, into the, also into the monitoring process and, uh, uh, and being really uh, integral part of uh, the, um, the push that we uh, are providing to the countries to uh, the different reforms in the fundamental areas. And we also want to make the process more dynamic. That is also uh, brings us back to, and in particular, uh, to the negotiations with Serbia and, and Montenegro. And uh, the, the, as you know, the methodology was initially designed uh, for uh, um, the preparation of the process for Albania and Macedonia, but uh, uh, it was then extended also to, um, uh, to Serbia and Montenegro. And here the logic is based on uh, basically looking at these clusters of chapters. What does it mean in practice? It means really try to work um, and allow for a more thorough political uh, discussions on thematic areas, identify also how these different areas interact with each other and, and, and helping therefore the countries aligning uh, to the EU, but also involving the countries more also in, into EU policies at an early stage. I can refer to the digital agenda, to the trans-European networks, and so on and so forth. But then, of course, the cluster on fundamentals has a particular role in all that, not only because we have connected much more strongly rule of law, economic criteria, public administration uh, reform, um, but also because of the central role that the fundamental um, cluster uh, play in the whole pace of, of the negotiations. And you are familiar uh, certainly with, with some of the basic elements. No cluster can be open before the fundamentals. There has to be uh, also a continuous uh, progress uh, throughout the negotiation process, otherwise uh, um, uh, delays and also uh, uh, stop can be put on the negotiation process. Um, and then finally, the predictability. Um, we also want to make clear that the conditions, of course, are important, they have to be respected, but of course, there have to be clear implications, positive or negative, depending on where the progress has been achieved uh, or not. Um, and that can also become an important element of incentives for um, reforms to be uh, undertaken. Now, this is really in a nutshell, let's say, the fundamental elements of uh, what the um, new methodology is about. Um, when it comes to um, where we are, uh, let's say, with the, uh, with the uh, assessment of the impact of that, well, uh, let me put it this way. It is obviously very early to assess that, but we are confident that uh, um, on all of these four pillars, we will see a positive impact once we can really implement the methodology. And I can certainly tell you that from the Commission side, we are very much looking forward to uh, uh, proceeding uh, with the possibility of uh, uh, applying the methodology. And is uh, really for that that we look forward uh, to a positive decision on the opening of negotiations for Albania and North Macedonia. What we are already looking at and following the decision in June to apply the methodology also for Serbia Montenegro, hopefully we will already be able to see how this had uh, an impact on the pace of the developments in those countries. Um, and we will have certainly a first uh, kind of state of play assessment uh, with the enlargement package that we expect to finalize and, and issue in, in October. But of course, this is a process that has just started. As I said, we will have uh, already uh, started the implementation for Serbia and Montenegro, but for a short period of time. And obviously, the whole new methodology methodology was initially designed for Albania and Macedonia, and we hope that uh, soon we will be able to move forward on that. I will not go into the country uh, specific issues. I will really start that. This is really the main elements of where we are on, on, on our side. And, uh, and of course, I look forward to uh, taking the discussions on some of these elements. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for, for this overview and, and for providing us a bit of an insight on, in, on the ideas uh, behind the new methodology in, in a nutshell. And I, I would like to hand over to, to Gerald uh, Knaus. Um, you have in early 2020 brought forward your own proposal of how, in your view, the, the accession process needs to be changed into basically a two-step approach. Um, your idea is that the countries of the Western Balkans should first be integrated into the single market and EU accession should follow later. Later. Why do you think such a drastic change is necessary, and 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 why, in your view, would it uh, would it be able to deliver better, uh, Mr. Knaus? Floor is yours. Well, first of all, thanks a lot. I hope you understand me. 
I uh, have to improvise a little bit because I got stuck in the Ankara traffic from a meeting from the Minister for European Integration. And uh, I had to find this cafe and uh, my leverage to get them to turn down the music is very limited, which reminds me of the leverage of the European Union in Turkey, which is today, as I could see in meetings in the last two days, unfortunately also rather limited. You know, to get Turkey to do things the European Union wants, for example, to let German citizens leave Turkey when they are blocked from leaving or to see political prisoners, uh, people, parliamentarians, NGO activists released from prison or to influence what Turkey does in its neighborhood. On all of this, what we've seen in the last few years is that the European Union's influence has been very, very limited. And it has been limited from the moment Turks no longer believed that the EU accession is real. And that is a very real threat. Because today, across the Balkans, more and more politicians and more publics are realizing that the prospect of EU accession is not real. Uh, Turkey has been negotiating the longest. We should have more influence on Turkey now than before, and we don't. Serbia and Montenegro have been negotiating the second longest. We should have seen most reforms in Serbia when it comes to democracy, the rule of law, uh, and of course the EU are key, but we don't. Now, why is this a problem? And uh, I'll stop in a second with this analysis of the problems, because when we look at Europe, the influence Europe had on the Balkans was never about money. I mean, I don't need to go to Afghanistan or Iraq to point out that a lot of money does not buy us a lot of influence. It's been that the politicians and the leaders believed it was a road to a better future that was clear, reachable, and that made reforms, even difficult ones, worthwhile. And that has been the difference between the Caucasus, Eastern Europe, now I'm proposing to restore EU influence. And we, I'm, to sorry, do it I'm sorry, in I'm a sorry way for that interrupting. I'm sorry for interrupting, but your line is not very clear. So what I would now try to do is switch off your video and make uh, to try and see if we can still yes. hear you because otherwise very you're good. breaking up. So please continue. Oh, I apologize. Okay. So I hope this works better. And if not, give me a sign. And again, I apologize. So far, um, so good. So what we are, is this better? Is it better? Okay. So what I what I propose, I'll be I'll be very short then, not to torture you with the bad connection. We are proposing something the EU has done before and has in fact already done in part in the Balkans, which is to have a, a very credible and attractive and concrete interim goal. When Jacques Delors was under pressure because France did not want Austria and Finland and Norway and Sweden to join the EU or the, then the European Economic Community, he created a two-step process, which was you first joined the what was then created a European economic area, which is the four freedoms. You become fully part of the single market, but you're not yet on the table. You don't yet have a veto in foreign policy. You don't yet take full decisions. You are becoming a rule taker. But as a rule taker, a single market, you have all the economic benefits, the costs of which we now see in the case of Brexit, um, of not having them are enormous. So the idea is if we would offer each of the six Western Balkan countries that wants to, it's an offer, it's a choice. Uh, the roadmaps, the concrete conditions, which are specified on the website of the Norwegian foreign ministry that Norway has to fulfill to be part of the single market, plus the conditions of the rule of law, which there needs to be a track record, that each of these countries gets the chance within a reasonable period, if they meet all these criteria to enjoy the four freedoms, to be part of the single market. Now, this is very similar to the transport community the EU already created with the Balkans in a very narrow area, where the Balkan countries, all six of them are members of the transport community, are supposed to adopt the whole key, including procurement and other issues, where in the future courts of the EU countries are supposed to be able to ask the European Court of Justice, where uh, in theory, 
you know, they could join the single market in a very narrow area. Imagine if this would be offered across the board to all six countries if they meet the criteria. Now, why is this attractive to the countries? Because it's a road, it's the road to the EU and it's a very attractive interim goal. Why is it attractive for the EU? Because it would immediately restore EU influence. It would also, and this is where this idea comes from, it could also be acceptable to skeptics in France and in the Netherlands. Because as we know, when France proposed an alternative uh, to the present accession process, and we talked to the French a lot at the time, uh, one of the ideas was more, more steps. And one step was join the single market before you join the EU, that was in the French proposal. So instead of having six steps, you just have two, but it is the law idea. Now, why uh, would this help us assert our influence on the rule of law? Because countries obviously would have to have a track record. Before you have the benefits of the single market, you would need to prove that your courts are independent, that you are able to enforce these rules. And uh, one way to then ensure that there's no backsliding is that once you join the single market, you put in a rule of law clause. If countries don't meet the conditions anymore, if they don't implement EU rules, well, then they wouldn't be enjoy the benefits. I think it would be urgent to think about a way to assert EU influence because the rhetoric we've been seeing in the last two years on board on uh, questioning the constitutional structures, on war criminals being celebrated as heroes, um, on uh, you know war becoming thinkable again, all of this we've heard before. We've heard it, and I remember it very well from the late 80s, leading up to what became a terrible period for the Balkans. And I am now sitting in Turkey, where everything that went wrong in the 1990s is back now. Political prisoners, suppression of minorities, uh, uh, political justice, hyperinflation. You know, Turkey turned full circle despite negotiating with the EU. This is a real threat in the Balkans, and I think we shouldn't let it go there. We should do something to preempt it. And apologies again for the bad acoustics, but I look forward to the debate. Thank you, thank you very much um, for, for presenting this proposal. And um, I would like to hand over immediately to Simonida Katsaska. Uh, the Think for Europe network has repeatedly made suggestions to strengthen conditionality in the EU accession process. And um, you have also recently proposed um, a more gradual approach to integration. Could you explain to us what are your thoughts, especially from, from the region's perspectives on, on, on the proposal that we just heard? And where does your own proposal or tense proposal differ in, in, that, in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, and thanks for uh, the invitation. It's very tricky to be speaking on behalf of a network, so I might make a disclaimer somewhere where it's my opinion <laughs> instead of representing uh, all six. You're very right to note, we've been, for some time, for the last couple of years, we've been working a lot on the, the rule of law conditionality, and we've been calling for um, a more detailed EU approach in this area, which uh, in my opinion should be ultimately linked to the rule of law uh, mechanism of the European Union down the road as a single instrument which should help us all uh, be measured against uh, similar uh, or the same uh, benchmarks. Uh, but then uh, I think that get all to explain some of the issues and um, uh, we also felt that it might be a need to go a bit outside of the box and to think to think more uh, creatively because we do feel uh, that uh, we are we are stuck and I mean this is um, this might uh, feel like uh, in in historical terms a decade or maybe two decades might not be too much but when you're actually living it then the two decade accession process of the region seems very long to you and you need you think of ways in which uh, this can be uh, improved. So that's the starting point of um, the approach that the, of the proposal that we put forward uh, at the beginning of the Slovenian presidency with the Center for European Policy and Studies uh, from Brussels. It uh, moves on to basically, to given the two decade of experience of some of these countries, let's say like my own North Macedonia, which has had a stabilization and association agreement for two decades now. And with all of the discussions on the sectoral integration, 
we also played with the idea that um, uh, the binary in or out concept might be might not be the best suited at this point to think of in terms of DAWR integration uh, in the European Union. So we proposed what we were, uh, what I would like to call a phased approach for, to membership, although with our colleagues, uh, the differentiated integration to enlargement was, was used. And uh, most of us that study European uh, integration were very wary of the word different, differentiated integration in the um, beginning of the 2000s. But then again, now we kind of came to terms with actually uh, uh, putting forward it as a possible way to move uh, sectoral integration of uh, the region forward in uh, through a, a phased approach to uh, to membership, which would also go back to what was the also proposed at several points through the revisions of the enlargement uh, methodology, also in 2018 with Juncker's proposal in terms of actually allowing the candidate can, the candidates from the Western Balkans to be engaged in some of the bodies of the European Union, such as the parliaments through varying through various um, arrangements. The uh, this would mean basically advancing the Western Balkans according to their performance to some of the rights of the membership process, but at the same time the member states would maintain uh, the uh, a sort of a post accession conditionality, which was the case in Bulgaria with uh, Bulgaria and uh, Romania, which also goes along the lines of the current uh, um, cluster approach, more or less, because some of the clusters might not be that much sectoral in some of the uh, proposals that uh, we saw in the actual way that they are proposed. Now, uh, this would mean, this is likely to mean, and uh, I think this goes all also along the, uh, goes also for Essie's proposal. This might mean a form of a, a this might necessitate a, a legal instrument which the member states will need to adopt because you can't just allow them uh, in any form of a sectoral integration, either the, the single market. And this brings us also to the question of why would some of the countries that are currently putting bilateral issues or that just don't feel okay with the process, why would they actually get along? And this is the this is also the perennial question that we have here in terms of uh, the council decision that would have to that would have to uh, follow. We are trying to deal with some of the inner um, question marks that we know some of the EU member states may have. But uh, I think for any of our proposals, the starting point would actually be a political would be political will to reform the process and to bring these countries sooner to closer to uh, to the European uh, to the European uh, Union because in any of these cases we are talking about the unanimous decision of the of the council like uh, we also in our proposals besides the phased uh, approach to membership or differentiated integration as some of my colleagues would prefer uh, we do think that there is a need for, uh, as we used to think, uh, for uh, more detailed, consistent and quantified methodology and clear roadmaps from the EU, which is something where we stand, I think, also on the same side with Get Out's proposal. Because uh, we all go back to the example of the visa liberalization uh, process, where the benchmarking was much more clear, where the assessments were clearer. And um, we give some examples of the work that Sigma has been doing and we have been adopting in in terms of the, their assessments on the reform of public administration as a way forward in, the, in terms of the assessments. We've been doing our own methodology. These are all just also to be clear with, these are because we are talking, you use the word drastic uh, when you actually introduced uh, Get Out. These, some of these proposals might sound drastic to some of the to outsiders. But then when you're in the process um, for a long time, then you feel that maybe uh, we need to go beyond the, beyond the standard toolbox to uh, think of, because um, smaller adjustments to the process evidently did not, uh, did not make, um, did not bring a, a breakthrough. Uh, in both of our proposals, I think that the rule of law is a key segment uh, here, and I think that's the big questions of why would these countries of the region possibly comply with some of, advance on the rule of law, possibly for something that they might see as a smaller gain. But if it's a more realistic gain at this point, then that's uh, that's also on the side of the argument uh, on the argument for. Um, in some, basically, uh, we do think that there is a need to think also um, outside of the box because 
uh, we don't, we, unless something uh, drastic, also using your terminology, would happen in the EU member states on the short term, we really don't see that the current model is delivering either for the European Union or for, uh, for the region. And I'll stop there to have, because I would like to uh, chip in the debate later. Thank you. Thank you, Simonita. And um, you, you gave the keyword member states, and I would I would like to now um, finally bring in also Sabine Stör um, from the perspective of the German government. I mean, the German government has been one of the EU member states that is still very active in the region. We just saw Chancellor Merkel's um, farewell visit to the region as well. And um, I think also during the German presidency and, and, and even beyond, a lot of efforts have been invested into trying to resolve the deadlock between Bulgaria and North Macedonia. Um, from, from your perspective, from the German government's perspective, what are your thoughts on these reform proposals and how do you think that the process can be best revitalized? Because I think what we do all agree with um, here is, is, is that the current pace of, of the process and the current progress is, is, is certainly not satisfying to either of the sides. So what would be your thoughts on this? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me um, at this at this event. Of course, it's a it's a privilege to speak on a day sort of so shortly after the visit of Chancellor Merkel to the region, uh, where she she made clear once more the significance uh, German politics attaches uh, to um, to the region, to the Western Balkans, to the enlargement process, where she underlined uh, her clear and, and the, the clear German commitment uh, to enlargement enlargement and where she also put uh, the significance of the Western Balkans for the EU into, uh, into a geopolitical perspective, uh, saying how important, um, again, it, it's not new, but still uh, it is important to say uh, that it is important for the EU, for its stability and prosperity, to have like-minded neighbors, to have stable neighbors, uh, and not only neighbors, but uh, to include the region of the Western Balkans, which, geogra which geographically uh, is in the European Union uh, territory and uh, where we share so much of common history and also human bonds to integrate uh, the Western Balkans into the EU. Uh, so she made that very clear. And um, let me stress that I don't see huge differences uh, in this topic uh, when it comes to potential uh, parties potentially forming a new government after the general elections on the 26th of September. We had, I think, a year ago or one and a half years ago, a debate on the Western Balkans in the German Bundestag, and there was unanimity, unanimity on, on this general goal and on the significance we attach, uh, we attach to the region. Um, so, so far, I think everything's fine. Um, I'm following live discussions on the Burdo Declaration. Um, which, which are ongoing in Coreper, and uh, there uh, we have, of course, a discussion on how to mention uh, the enlargement uh, part uh, of, of our engagement towards the Western Balkans. So it is true uh, that while everyone is reconfirming the general principle, um, there are differing, op differing opinions uh, in member states what that means in concrete next steps and in, in concrete policy. So there is a lot of work and, and con convincing uh, arguments uh, have to be found. Um, now, when it comes to what does that mean for a more effective, uh, for a more effective enlargement process, I personally, um, now being in my fifth year of dealing with the issue, um, I personally believe that we will not find the final, uh, the final solution for this challenge only within the enlargement process. So what is very good is that we decided on the new methodology and many of the proposals I hear uh, from Simonida uh, from Simonida's uh, work and paper or the paper of the network are already potentially there in the new methodology. And as Michaela mentioned, it has been adopted uh, by Montenegro and Serbia only last June. Um, and it could not uh, yet be applied uh, with North Macedonia and Albania uh, for the reason that we were not able to have to hold the first intergovernmental conference. So there is a lot of potential 
including uh, integration into certain policies, etc., uh, including uh, more more scrutiny, um, uh, clearer focus, etc., in this new methodology. And I think it's very good if we start um, finally now to apply it uh, with Serbia uh, and 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 Montenegro, and very hopefully, uh, hopefully very very soon also with North Macedonia and Albania. <clears throat> so um, I'm I'm all for this. Um, I am not so sure that uh, an interim goal of joining the economic European Economic Area is really so attractive as to uh, overcome the huge obstacles with respect to rule of law, anti-corruption, democracy, etc. And as Gerald Knaus rightly mentioned, those are preconditions also for joining uh, the European Economic Area. So uh, all the countries uh, that were mentioned uh, that wanted to join uh, and where one had to maybe offer an interim solution, uh, there was no doubt that they uh, fully fulfill those criteria. Um, so we are in a different uh, in a different game here. And uh, if the main obstacle is or, or the main problem is that those reforms uh, are so difficult that there has to be a real incentive, a very big carrot, uh, visible uh, and, and reachable, then I'm not so sure whether this, uh, this interim goal really does the job. Um, so um, very much for um, integration into economic policies where possible, where uh, were, um, sort of useful for both sides, um, but on the other hand, we have to see uh, that uh, there are quite some problems uh, with some members uh, or some European countries that did not join the European Union, but join the common market. And it's a constant um, discussion and a constant debate with them, uh, what that means. Uh, so I think this, I even feel that maybe uh, rule of law and, and other conditions have even, uh, I mean, they are as strict as for joining. Um, and therefore, for Norway, um, Switzerland, uh, yeah, and, and Finland, let's say for Norman, Austria and Finland, it was very reachable to have that and to have this interrupt step and some like Norway even decided to remain there. Um, but um, again, some doubt uh, whether whether the incentive is enough uh, to do those those reforms and whether this is really uh, an interim goal which would be uh, easy to reach or we would be able or the countries would be able to reach uh, in a nearer future uh, than fulfill the accession criteria. Um, so um, I don't have an answer to, uh, to uh, the question what then maybe even outside the accession pro process or in, in addition to the accession methodology uh, would be the stimulus, uh, the stimulus to bring about uh, those difficult reforms. Gerald Knaus also mentioned that it worked out with the Eastern Europeans, um, uh, and one could easily say that they saw a strong stimulus because they had a perception of insecurity coming from the East, whether, whether rectified or not uh, is not our topic here, but they had that perception and therefore they had this very strong stimulus to overcome <clears throat> all those obstacles. I mean, they changed government every half a year uh, in the transition period in the 90s. Um, they went through very difficult times, uh, but having this overarching goal to join NATO, of course, uh, but also EU, uh, what can be the stimulus? I don't know, but I really fear that it has to come from the countries themselves. We have to uphold the perspective. Uh, we, of course, have to do whatever we can uh, to integrate the countries, to talk to them, to take them seriously, um, to also listen to their opinions when it comes to the future of Europe, for example. Uh, we think that is very important to listen to the citizens of the Western Balkans, also in the context of the Conference of the Future of Europe. But in the end, we have, I think, uh, to remain realistic uh, and see that the stimulus for a real change change 
has to come uh, has to come from within, and then we can support it and hopefully uh, channel uh, channel it into the right direction. So far from my side. Thank you very much for this. And um, I can already see two raised hands in the audience, um, but I would have quick follow up questions to, to each and every one of our, our panelists. I would I'd like to ask you to be really short around three minutes um, since the first round was rather long. And I would invite everyone in the audience, if you have any questions, raise your hand and or use the question and answer function. Um, and we will get to that in, in just a few minutes. But before, um, I would like to first um, give, give you, um, Ms. Matuela, the chance from the engineer's perspective to also share your thoughts on the proposals that we have just heard. And um, where, to what degree you see this already as the direction um, the new methodology is headed and or, or how how can this even be be further strengthened this how how Simonita said differentiated integration so please um, the floor is yours thank you very much and, and thank you I think that there are of course uh, very interesting ideas in in uh, in all that has been uh, said I will maybe start uh, with with a question in a way uh, to to the other members of the panel because in a way don't you see almost a bit of a contradiction in saying on one side the accession process must be real? I think uh, uh, Gera said, said that in order to really be the leverage and at the same time look at an interim goal. If I look at what has happened uh, in the discussion, for instance, that uh, took place in the past years um, uh, about uh, what was uh, at the time the regional economic area, which now has evolved into this concept of the common regional market. There was a lot of reading into that as uh, basically an, an alternative to a session. And that can be actually, you know, there is a bit of a risk at least that uh, talking about intermediate steps, uh, you know, would be read as, uh, uh, you know, lowering the, the, the bar in a way, or not lowering the bar, but lowering the ambition, uh, let's say, and therefore presenting this as, as a, as, a, as, a, as an alternative to, to, to membership. Um, the, other, the other point that uh, I think is also, we should reflect about it. Uh, I believe we have lost- Foreseen reasons that we would actually go back into reverse. Sorry, you can hear me? You're back. You were just uh, lost for a second, but you're back now. So please continue. OK, so I was saying, um, don't you also um, see a little bit of a risk that by uh, having the, um, say, the, the full freedom as the basis for this interim step, uh, don't you see the risk that this would imply reverting again, inversing uh, the, the, the prioritization in the reform that we are basically asking the countries to implement. What we are trying to do basically with this revised methodology, but this is the result of an evolution of the methodology uh, in the past years, is actually to put some of the difficult reforms on rule of law that really, uh, for instance, uh, and not only, but say rule of law to take the example, that is really at the core of the transformation of these countries. Uh, as uh, you know, at the very beginning of the process, exactly because they are complex and they take time, uh, you know, by, by reverting this order, uh, we, we risk that uh, we go back to basically where we were before. And one of the lessons learned was, of course, that, uh, you know, these are the reforms that take time uh, and that have implications, in fact, also on the possibility of setting up a, a functioning, let's say, internal market. And that is the other element that I think would be somehow we would risk of losing, of course, to a certain extent. What we are trying to do with the new methodology is actually to integrate through this cluster approach, and not only, but to integrate more and work on the synergies between the different areas, integrating more aspects of rule of law to aspect of internal market, We're looking at public procurement as an aspect, for instance, of uh, you know, belonging to the chapters on fundamentals and so on and so forth. I know that I have little, little time, just a, a couple of, of extra, um, uh, of extra um, uh, uh, comments. Uh, of all the ideas that uh, both Simonida and Gerald have, have presented, there are already a lot indeed uh, in the new methodology. And there is a lot that somehow has to do with uh, um, associating basically the Western Balkans to EU policies uh, early uh, in the process. And this, uh, you know, I mentioned in my first um, intervention, uh, you know, the example of um, 
digital, uh, the, the example of uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, but if you also look at the way we have handled the um, COVID uh, crisis, I mean, apart from vaccines and vaccination campaigns, one of the things that was done, and was done only for the Western Balkans, was the association uh, to the EU Joint Procurement Agreement for uh, Medical Countermeasure, uh, to the EU Health Security Committee, and so on and so forth. So basically, there is a lot that is already happening in terms of integrating into different aspects of our policies, the Western, the Western uh, Balkans. I mean, there is much more to say on the topics are very, um, and it's also a very interesting, of course, um, discussion. But the bottom line is also that I think there is a lot of these ideas in the new methodology, and we haven't yet implemented the new methodology. And, and for me, it's really uh, now, you know, let's see what works of that. I think there is a lot in there that, in fact, address um, what uh, both uh, Simonina Guerra uh, mentioned, but also let me conclude with also saying that, of course, we are not happy with the pace of the transformation, the implementation reform. But I also think that we should not um, overlook that a number of actually important reforms, at least in some of the countries, have actually taken place. And they've taken place with the clear objective of joining the EU. So the leverage has worked and can still work if it is, of course, uh, real. Uh, and I conclude with this. Thanks. Thank you very much. And, and with that, um, over to you, um, Gerald Knaus, um, because actually, I mean, the, the, the question that was just asked to you by Ms. Matuela was one of the questions I was having. And I would add to that the, the question that was raised also earlier in the debate. How is, how is that, how's your proposal going to get over the, the bilateral um, vetoes, for example, in the council decision making? Because that, I think, is, is also one of the less technical but more political questions that, that we should address. So please, uh, Gerald Knaus, the floor yours. Sorry, and yes, and if you want, uh, you can turn off the camera again, so the, the acoustics might be better. Um, well, let me turn the camera off. All right, so I hope, uh, well, let me first say I agree, of course, with uh, uh, in saying that a lot of these elements are already there. The real difficulty is that we are, when it comes to the mobilizing power of EU engine, it which things do publics and politicians believe, right? I mean, I remember in this town here in Ankara in 2002, 2003, 2004, you could get the most drastic uh, taboo breaking reforms through because the public uh, and the majority of policymakers believed that it was better for Turkey to move in this direction. You know, there was a belief. Was it real then? I don't know. But it was, it was something people believed. So the question today is how do you generate uh, something that, you know, we have a number of problems. The Montenegro problem is all chapters have been opened. Do we see a real drive to reform? Or do we see a return to the sort of cultural wars, ethnic tensions, religious tensions, the talk of confrontations, that was precisely what we were trying to overcome. There is the problem of Bosnia, it's not been mentioned. It's not negotiating at the moment. Kosovo is not even able to apply. Now, the idea of the single market as an interim step is that it would be offered to all six countries, like the transport community, right? Now, on the communication, one more point. Politics is about easy, simple messages that are believed. Here, is, here are two simple messages. The first one, European economic integration from 1950 to 1992, the create the European Union, was about the single market. When we praise EU integration as a peace-building element in 42 years of post-war European history, it was about this, the single market. The union came later. When the union was created in 92, there was no longer any risk of war or, or, or rivalry between France and Germany and Italy and the Netherlands. But in the 1950s, economic integration made war unthinkable. Now in the Balkans, to offer the chance of rejoining the single biggest market in the world and its rules is what we need to make any return to war and conflict unthinkable. It's unlikely at the moment, but it's And if you read the newspapers, it's been discussed every day. If you listen to the Serbian Orthodox Church, it's talking about 
the new war for Kosovo. You know, if you listen to some issues, they're all thinkable. And that's my second point. Simple message for people. You can live like all the four freedoms for your business as citizen, as a worker, are reachable. And there we come to a contradiction, which I think is important. Uh, and both might be. Okay, you, you are breaking. You are breaking up again. So I would but, try. But uh, Ambassador Stör was pointing out. I'm, I'm sorry, you are breaking up again. I'll, I'll try again later um, to to give you to, to give you the floor. But uh, at the moment, we cannot really understand you. So so I would like to hand over to Simonida, especially also the the political question. I mean, we've talked about about the technicality of the approach it was a rather technical uh, conversation so far. Um, now putting putting on your your hat of, of, of being or of running a think tank in Skopje. Um, how do you assess the situation, the credibility of the European Union? What can the EU do to, to uh, regain its credibility also in, in the eyes of the public in North Macedonia? And do you think that a more differentiated approach uh, would, would, would restore this credibility or is more needed? Mm -hmm. So please, uh, Simonida, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I think I gave that disclaimer a couple of times. I think that without actually will of the EU member states to invest in uh, either reforming the process or a differentiated integration or to apply the accession methodology, the new revised methodology from the outset of the accession negotiations as it was intended to with Albania and North Macedonia, it's very difficult to restore to restore the credibility of the process overall of whatever in whatever type of a process that we are discussing. Because I would, I just wanted to also to respond to uh, Ms. Matuela. I agree with you completely that the risk of these approaches is also going to dilute the, um, up the appeal of the membership, the appeal of the goal and so on and so forth. But if we are depending on uh, the application of the new methodology in the given context of North Macedonia and Albania, we have to think of alternative uh, scenarios for some, we have to put them forward because in the long term, we have seen what the status quo um, does and what, where it can take us. So we are very concerned about that. And in, in, in these circumstances, we have to be very wary of the need also to reform the process. Just a couple of more, just two or three more sentences. I agree that the new methodology takes us in this, in this direction that we are discussing in terms of the sectoral integration. But we are also hoping what we are proposing is to actually go back to some of the proposals to put our civil servants, our decision makers together with the EU decision makers on these policies to act because this, these forms of socialization have also proven to be crucial for the success of the integration process. So we are hoping that with the proposals we are pushing for to, to pull to uh, move these goalposts in terms of how far will these countries be, be integrated in the sectoral policies forward than what they are currently and also with the methodology. Yeah, I think I'll uh, I'll stop there. I mean, I don't have a magic answer to your question, how do we uh, put it forward? I think that uh, it's clear that uh, the EU has a decision-making problem in it in terms of the use, abuse and putting forward of conditions that have been likely to have no uh, relationship with the accession process. We have lived through that process once and we have survived that process once. Whether the process in North Macedonia, the EU accession can uh, survive another application of possibly in a condition that's not linked to the enlargement process, I'm not that certain. Thanks, uh, Simonida. And um, speaking of council decision making, in the end of the day, the, the elephant in the room is the unanimity unanimity principle in in the council. And I, I would like to hand over to to Sabine Stör one more time. Um, do you see any chance to to reform the decision making in the council on, on on these issues? And how how would you assess the awareness in the council, also in 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 other EU member states, when it comes to well the the impact this has on the credibility of the European Union as a whole, and also in the the end of the day by extension the commission because the council is is, is is increasingly not following commission's recommendations anymore so please Sabine Stör. 
Thank you. Yeah, um, only some points uh, to this. Uh, just one one answer uh, to Gerald Knaus. I think it would be an illusion to think that all six Western Balkan countries would be at the same time ready to join the uh, something like the economic uh, European Economic Area because of the precondition that rule of law democracy has to be in place before you can uh, because before you can join uh, the common market. Uh, so. That is why I believe that, yes, uh, integration, uh, better integration, sooner integration uh, is, is a good concept and we should uh, see that that somehow uh, becomes reality and where we can find possibilities. But uh, it, is, uh, it, it poses, finally, it poses the same questions and the same problems which we have in the, in the overall accession process. So um, that is because rule of law is, is so important. Um, majority voting is, of course, something we um, we would like to introduce in several uh, areas, also in some foreign policy areas, um, could be in, in uh, enlargement uh, policy too. But on the other hand, I think that would be very difficult and maybe it's a mid and long term goal but certainly nothing that would solve our current problems. Um, and um, therefore, I would like to repeat my, my main point. I think a lot of what has been said is important uh, and, and should be implemented and should be worked upon. I think we all should engage, of course, uh, the Commission, uh, which is already very active, but also individual member states and member states together to make uh, to, to support the enlargement process. But we also need uh, an open and, uh, and frank dialogue on, on the principles why we want that. So within the EU, why do we want uh, the Western Balkans be part, uh, a reformed and a democratic uh, and prosperous Western Balkans uh, be part of the European Union, but also in the Western Balkans, why do we want or why do you want uh, the, the, to become a member? And uh, if then suddenly some uh, rulers uh, of uh, countries uh, suddenly realize that this runs counter to their interest to stay in power um, because uh, sort of there are those preconditions on democracy, rule of law, media freedom, um, etc. And of course, if you take risks, then that means that you might all also lose uh, political power. That's an obstacle we cannot help from our side. And uh, um, we, we also know that some civil society organizations in some countries of the Western Balkans are criticizing the EU not for being too slow with opening chapters, but just the opposite uh, of being not uh, critical enough about uh, developments in certain areas. Um, so again, um, I think we all know the problems. We have to take it from the very concrete level, but at the same time, we have to lead that more strategic dialogue. And I also see um, that, that this is the only possible way out of the Bulgarian blockade uh, with respect uh, to North Macedonia, because uh, it is very legitimate to have uh, bilateral concerns. Each and every member state uh, and country in Europe has such concerns with a neighbor or with several neighbors. Um, many of them are, are not solved. There are constant problems, constant challenges. I mean, we have a huge department of the bilateral relations to EU members states, they exist and uh, there are problems, uh, but uh, the overarching goal to work together, to be together integrated in the EU um, should come first and then that helps to solve the problem. So I think we need this more fundamental discussion also and therefore I'm, I'm very glad that the Chancellor when she was in the region also put uh, the enlargement question into the geopolitical and overall political perspective. Thank you very much. And I promised to our audience that uh, they would get a chance to, to come in with questions. So um, I would like to open the floor now. And um, we would really just collect um, the questions that are out there, because in the interest of time, I, I think we can only do uh, one round. And um, for those uh, with uh, using the raise hand function, please very briefly introduce yourself. Although the person um, having raised the hand longest uh, likely does not need any introduction. So please, Emma Brock, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this possibility. And uh, I must thank you for this debate. I was in the last uh, three weeks uh, in that region around and I've met nearly all prime ministers and presidents of that part of the world. 
And I think uh, what Gerald Knauss has proposed in a certain way also, Mr. Kaczaska, is to open it in these new methods uh, have, um, uh, is seen as positively if it's not seen as a discrimination policy. And that is easy to say and mostly with the, the way Gerald Knauss proposes this. The European Parliament has in several reports already in the last 10, 12 years made the same proposal. I was a rapporteur of that report in the European Parliament. What we see at the moment is that we have to give signals to the region because of geopolitical reasons, which is understandable. Not the details of a not totally yet decided methodology. Nobody will understand that as a message in the population. And uh, here, I think we have a uh, uh, problem. On the other side, full membership is not possible for some time because of internal EU rules reasons, political ones. You see, automatism, the problem we have in Austria and France, for example, in such countries, but partly also in Germany. So that they see, just have the everything or nothing approach. Um, People are afraid about it because of several recent experiences. I do not agree with that, but that is the case. Uh, the second point is because of that, you get never anonymity, unanimity in that question. You go forward and there will be always someone find on a special issue, obstacles and delay that and so on and so forth, as we have seen it until now. And therefore we have to find also the point what is the integration capacity of the European Union? We worked on the constitutional treaty and therefore the Treaty of Lisbon in order to prepare a European Union for the last enlargement round to make the European Union more effective. We have to do that now too for the Western Balkans. It would be six countries more than we would have 33 countries with a veto. What does it mean for tax policy, for foreign security policy? That therefore the European Union herself must reform herself to be ready for integration. Nobody is asking this question. Even in the future of Euro conferences, it is not mentioned. And what Gerald Knauss proposes, I think it should not be the European economic area. It should be a type of European economic area. It must be not the same as with Norway. But with this approach of the internal market, that is the threat, uh, step forward. You can see here, progress for the citizen where you see the difference and um, that you can do it in one or the other way. To do the bilateral, uh, this way point by point, that is like the bilateral uh, solution with Switzerland where we have come now to a deadlock in that question. That might be not a proper way. And it's not discrimination because in the old uh, the, uh, EAA, uh, it is clear that all countries were handled in the same way, and some countries decided to stay in the basic camp, European economic area, and some others, and very soon went up as full members. Because if you have a type of economic area, then you have already 67% of the key community on board. How far we go, we have this rule of law question. We have to see how far we go. Therefore, it's a question of, uh, of uh, type of WEA but not uh, exactly the same way. But I think this means an, an important step forward. And come to Turkey, where we not talk about that, that might be also the final goal of Turkey in the European economic area, not as a full membership. But why an open the minds there, despite all- I'm, so, I'm sorry, the in the interest right of time, I need, I need to interrupt and more. ask you to-, to re just One wrap up sentence your more, point. madam. Of course. The right um, a moment, uh, 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 because of the internal development there. But we have with Turkey a customs union. Why do not come up with a customs union which is now a modern one because of the change in trade? That might be steps which are felt and keep such countries closer to us because of all the geostrategic reasons. And here I think is, uh, might be a lot of possibilities. I can understand our diplomats from Berlin and from Brussels and they have eloquently uh, explained to us the present policy, but the present policy will have on the Western Balkans no success. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Brook, also for sharing your, your years long uh, experience from the European Parliament. Um, before um, getting more questions in, I need to really ask um, all further questions to be really short because we, we do not have time otherwise to get answers to those questions. So, um, Jovan Kojicic, please, um, very briefly, your question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this posi possibility. I will be very, uh, very short. I mean, uh, I'm uh, representing the Institute for Public Governance, Human Rights and Environment from Montenegro. It's the regional institute. Uh, Madame Simonida Kalcharska in her presentation pointed the uh, role of law as a main issue and Madame Sabine Stor stressed also rule of law is so important, as well as mention in the sentence what that means in concrete steps, concrete policy. Uh, this is something I really mostly like. And if you can, uh, this is specifically question to Madame Sabine Stor and Madame Michaela Matuela. If you can translate this sentence, what that means in concrete, concrete steps, concrete policy, in relation to the new methodology of negotiation in practice, for instance, today no one citizen of Montenegro doesn't have the right to health in practice in Montenegro. It's not in accordance with the definition, methodology, and standards of EU. But at the same time, Montenegro was a leader in EU integrations how it is possible, whether it will be the same case in new methodology or not, and how it will work in practice with new methodology following such example, the right to health. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We had we had a question earlier, but I cannot see it anymore. So I'll just read um, the last question from the Q&A section, um, which is um, specifically to Gerald Knaus, though I would invite also the others to comment on um, economic integration. How do you assess the Open Balkans initiative um, is, is the question. And um, I would suggest, um, Ms. Matrela, since I think all, all questions were at least among others addressed to you, and I know that you have to leave soon, please go ahead. And, and, and start. Uh, the, uh, maybe I start from uh, the question that uh, you just uh, mentioned on, which is actually addressed to Gerald uh, uh, specifically on the Open Bank Initiative, but it's actually a very good uh, uh, element to bring into the discussion because we have focused very much on the integration, let's say, of the Western Balkans into the EU, but there is this very important dimension also of the integration within the region, which is actually also an important element to make actually the uh, region, uh, let's say, more attractive also for the EU and the EU citizens. And there is a little bit of a vicious circles in, in this process, right? I mean, the member states have maybe reluctances because of uh, internal reasons, because, but also because, of course, of the uh, slow uh, pace of uh, reforms. But there is also an element of uh, what Sabine was saying earlier. Uh, we need to uh, understand why we want to do it. And, and part of it is also to, um, uh, to, 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 to analyze and promote why we are doing it, also from the point of view, what, does it, what are the interests of the EU in this? And I think there is this element of integration that is important. And I must say that uh, uh, we have some very good examples in the past uh, uh, year, and also some not very good example uh, of that in the past year, in the sense that uh, um, um, the, um, if I take the, the example, for instance, of Romi, where there has been a very successful uh, implementation of uh, the um, uh, of, of that within the region, we are trying now uh, launching a new roadmap for the integration of the region into the EU from the Romi perspective. But when we look at uh, maybe some of the other elements, for instance, of the creation of the common regional market, there have been a lack of uh, a lack of will on that. And that is again, you know, where I, I wonder how much we can actually work on the creation of a single market with the EU when we are facing these kind of challenges, which are of course are not technical but political, but that will be exactly the same challenges that we would be facing in the creation of a, a single market within uh, with the EU. Uh, and that, uh, you know, interesting also indeed to hear uh, also the others' view on the uh, Open Balkan Initiative. From our perspective, what is important is, of course, that there is progress on, on this regional agenda, and it's very important that this regional agenda remains 
uh, inclusive and open, of course, uh, to others. And, and we have to make sure that this is not uh, working in the opposite direction. But that, I think, is a very important point uh, on that. Um, uh, on uh, uh, maybe then uh, touching uh, upon uh, briefly on on uh, rule of law, I'm not sure I understood exactly the, the sort of the angle of, of the question. I mean, defining what what it means, of course, it's uh, it's uh, it, it would take a little bit uh, more than than a few words. But uh, uh, when uh, uh, we talk about putting this at the center of the process, um, in fact, in many respects, the reason why we have uh, revised the connection between progress in the rule of law uh, reforms and uh, the pace of the overall negotiations is, of course, having in mind also the fact that we were not satisfied with the pace of uh, the reforms in the countries that were already negotiating. I mean, that is, uh, of course, the, the reality of it. Um, now, there are two dimensions. It's not only process, it's process of sub and substance. And of course, what we want to see is not only the application of the methodology in terms of looking at, um, you know, ticking the box of uh, a list uh, of, uh, of various uh, benchmarks that we, we have been set, but it's really a matter of implementing in a way uh, that uh, uh, we look at the um, depth of the reforms. If you look at some of the reforms that have been uh, pushed forward uh, and have been um, taken forward by the countries, I take the example of the judicial reform in Albania that I follow particularly closely, uh, this is the type of reforms that have the potential of changing not only the judiciary, but of changing the country. And that is basically what we are after. Um, so I hope that uh, I give you at least some elements to answer the, the question. So I'll, I'll stop here to give space maybe also uh, to, to the others. Thank you very much. And let me use this opportunity to already thank you for, for joining us, because I know that you, you have to leave very soon um, and, and we are a little behind schedule. Um, so without further ado, um, let's try again um, if we can uh, hear Gerald Knaus better now and I'll switch off your camera from, from the very beginning um, yeah, to give you a chance. So please, um, Gerald Knaus. Yes, well, thanks a lot. And as as the day is advancing, the music in Ankara seems to get louder and louder. I hope you still hear me. Um, I, I did hear you and uh, I, I agree very much with what Elmar Brock said. At the moment, accession of any country, including the front runners, including Montenegro, which opened every single chapter, accession is simply not going to happen. Just ask the head of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Dutch parliament. I think it is Gerd Wilders at the moment who's become the head of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, what do you think about uh, the Dutch parliament agreeing to new accessions? And I will look forward to the French debate and the French elections. So let's be very clear that ultimate goal at the moment is politically for the next decade, very hard to mobilize people. But the current process is also failing to mobilize people. Uh, and I, I'm convinced that Europe has had a huge impact on the Balkans. The reason the Balkans are not like the Caucasus, you know, in the 1990s, you had wars in the Balkans and wars in the Caucasus. In the last 20 years, you had no war in the Balkan and you had wars in the Caucasus. One reason is that there was a strong EU perspective that transformed the region. But at the moment we're losing that. And I, I think we don't need much imagination. Just look around Europe at every area around Europe to imagine what it means if things slip back into the past. And, you know, Simonida is from Skopje. I remember the situation in Macedonia, uh, sorry, North Macedonia, where everybody thought in the nineties, well, at least this country is stable and nothing will go wrong. Brilliant. We don't need to do anything. And then suddenly we almost had a civil war there. You know, I, I don't want to imagine what in the next five years can happen in different countries in the Balkans if the EU loses its influence. So perhaps to sum up my last sentence, we need a vision that is credible, how North Macedonia and Bosnia can catch up like Romania has done in the last 20 years. While that why there will be no political prisoner in the Balkans in the next 10 years, unlike Turkey. Why war will be as unthinkable in the Western Balkans as it is in the EU. And how the four freedoms that are the core of what the EU means to citizens become real to this generation 
of people in the Western Balkans. All of this we can achieve. And I have high hopes that people will realize that the status quo is not serving the European interest. It's certainly not serving the interest of reformers in the Western Balkans. And again, my apologies and I, uh, I, I'm still very happy that I was able to take part in this debate. Thank you. Can I ask you, sorry, just, just one sentence on the Open Balkans Initiative, because ah, the sorry, yes. question was directed to you. A absolutely, and I, I apologize. I think any form of regional lowering of barriers is a good thing, but can never replace the detailed work that countries need to do to move closer to the EU. So I think the way to get all of them to be able to do away with the borders between them is as in Ireland, if all of them adopt the same rules on the single market. So the vision should be that in a few years, the borders between all the Western Balkan countries become invisible because like in Northern Ireland and Ireland, they are all applying the same rules with the same institutions. Now, anything, regional that increases mobility is good, but it can never replace this. Thank you. Uh, thank you for adding that. And um, Simonida, very briefly also for your final remarks and um, whatever questions you would like to respond to. I would just like to uh, go back and reiterate on uh, the reflections on the Dutch and the French debates that I think that any all of our proposals at the end of the day will depend on the will of the French and the Dutch parliaments. So uh, I would kindly appeal basically for the need to work with the member states, going back to what Sabina said, to understand why is enlargement in both of our common interests and not just perceive enlargement as um, us begging on, on the EU's uh, door, because I think that any reform needs to start from uh, there. Uh, just a quick comment on the Open Balkans. Uh, my, um, I think we will need some historical distance to assess uh, the, polit the political or the actual implementation of this initiative. I only hope that it doesn't bring the bar for the region lower than uh, the one that is usually set by the EU, because that's the risk that some of us are seeing. But if it's actually, it's very difficult to be in principle against it or to be, to go, to be critical of it, but we are yet to see as to what will actually uh, come out of it. And thanks for the organization, Valeska and the STMP. Thanks, uh, Simonida. And as, as, as often or as usual, the, the council has the last word. So um, I would like to hand over to uh, Sabine Stör. I would ask you to comment also on the rule of law questions and open Balkans, but of course, feel free uh, to add anything that you would like to get in as your final remarks. Yeah, thank you. Of course, not the council, but just one member state. Um, yeah, to, uh, I, I would still insist that at the moment, short, short term, the main problem of uh, the enlargement process and that the enlargement process is stalled is not uh, the absorption capacity of the EU or the, the Dutch uh, parliament, but is a lack of progress in the fundamentals uh, in, in the region, in the six uh, countries. Uh, and that may be also uh, as a response to the question from Montenegro, if I understood it correctly, backsliding or problems, they don't go unnoticed. Maybe um, from a perspective from the region, uh, some, someone should would, would like to have a more explicit reaction to whatever you had in mind uh, in, in uh, sort of when, when it comes to reforms or fundamentals, uh, but uh, be aware that it does not go unnoticed and uh, the skepticism and all those discussions we are now having about how to put the enlargement perspective, for example, in the Burdo uh, declaration, also come from deficits which are very well uh, seen and recognized uh, here uh, or in, in member states and in the respective national parliaments. Uh, so there is also responsibility there uh, to show that and, uh, and to be convincing, uh, of course, by, by the government. Open Balkans, I can only uh, and fully subscribe to what Michaela has said. Regional integration, of course, is very good and very positive, uh, but it should be inclusive. Um, 
in our mind. And that brings me to the Berlin process. Uh, we, um, there, there has no final decision ha has been taken to uh, the future of the Berlin process, but, uh, and, and it is clear that it should go maybe even closer hand in hand uh, with EU, EU processes. But on the other hand, uh, there has been uh, the effort to bring it to the region and to create more ownership in the region. I think not unsuccessful because we uh, had meetings organized. We even had a co-chairmanship uh, by Bulgaria and North Macedonia, unfortunately hampered by the COVID crisis. And therefore I think it could not develop um, the, the power it could have had if, uh, if uh, in, in, in other circumstances. But I think that would also be a way forward when we think about regional integration, but again, inclusive regional integration. And there the Berlin process has a lot of, a lot to give and a lot to offer. Um, and it could be a good way forward also to have more ownership in the Berlin process uh, when it comes to regional integration, which then of course is very closely linked to EU integration. That has always been uh, the, the effort and the, game, uh, the, the goal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also for, for these clarifications. And um, in, in the interest of time, I'm not going to wrap anything up, but Simonita asked me for one last sentence. And since we have been talking about the Western Balkans, I, I'll grant you the final sentence, uh, Simonita. And thank then you. If we want, if the EU member states want to show that the process works, I would still argue that North Macedonia and Albania would be the cases in point. And I think it might not be too late to salvage that train. Uh, if you don't want to make the big changes or the drastic changes, then we can show it in these two. I'm done. Thank Thanks, you. Simonida. We, we even ended on a positive uh, outlook in, in, in that sense. So I would like to thank all of our panelists um, for, for joining this discussion. I apologize for, for the delay we've had. And um, I wish everyone um, a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.